Welcome to Colony TV, the governmental educational channel for the town of Colony. It goes all my life's a circle, sunrise and sundown. The moon rolls through the night time till the daybreak comes around. And all my life's a circle, but I can't tell you why. Season spinning round again, the years keep rolling by. Top of the day to you. I'm Joe Doolittle. And I'm Kate Dudding. And this is Story by Story. Sharing the human experience. And we are like to have a good time sharing stories today. Oh, of course. We always have a good time with our guests. We do, we do. We have a very special guest, and we'll come to her in a minute. But uh, what's the most interesting thing you've been doing with storytelling lately, my friend? Well, I was asked to be part of a program at a, um, Lifelong Learning, Academy for Lifelong Learning in Saratoga. They have a spring semester which lasts eight weeks, and one of the study groups this spring is reading a novel set in Afghanistan. And so they're having three sessions where they're having speakers about Afghanistan and wow. the area, and then the fourth one they'll be discussing the book. So I was asked to tell Muslim stories. Um, you were asked to tell Muslim stories. Right. Do you have a big uh, a volume of Muslim stories? Well, as it happens, oh. Nasruddin, Nasruddin. And, and ah. Nasruddin, there are thousands of stories about him. And so, uh, so that was my first thought. But then I thought, oh, but I have stories about Muslims I've come to know ah. at, uh, through Children at the Well and the Interfaith Story Circle. So I have, I know, I'm, the program is. Muslim stories, long, long ago and now. Long, long ago and now. Yes. Wow. Well, that, that's, that's a wonderful thing. And you did this as part of that lifelong learning program up in Saratoga? Right, right. Never and too old to learn to tell new stories. Oh, right. And one story, I, I created it in... 2008, but haven't found a place really to tell it. And, and uh -huh. I revisited it because I was taking a class there in creative non uh, Creative, creative non writing, yeah, okay, there we Creative go. nonfiction. And so I said, oh, let me revisit that story because I need to tell it for the Muslim program. And it's about um, a naturalized American citizen, uh, First Lieutenant Mohsen Nakvi who served in Iraq and in Afghanistan. Oh. Wow. And uh, so while he grew up in further downstate in Wappingers Falls, um, Newburgh area, um, he has ties to this area too. So, and I learned about him through articles and a video in the Times Union. Oh. So. Boy, you have been busy with interesting things. Yes, yes. I was going to tell a story about my friend Kate coming to <laughs> Arthur's Market, where she was the featured teller at our first Tuesdays program, and she did Julia Child. <laughs> and she was wonderful, memorable. And to just encourage her a bit, I promised her that if she came to Arthur's we would have some special Julia Child cake. And it was oh, her Ren de Saba, Queen of Sheba cake. It's chocolate. It's, it's sort of like chocolate, to, to die for chocolate it's cake. It's almost Only, fudge. It is it, really it's, something. It's, it is just spectacular. You don't, you know, they say, you know, this eight inch cake can feed 12, and it can because it is so rich it's a it's a, it was just it was just the right touch uh, to accent the the good fellowship and the good stories of the evening mm -hmm. so thank you for doing that and, and, and it's a lovely setting and it's a, Arthur's is my husband said you know this is really a great place great it's place, yeah. it's you you've got big windows into I guess the village of the stockade I guess yeah, you have it's, to say. It's, it's 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 charming and, mm -hmm. and they do a nice thing with uh, with their uh, light fair and um, and good desserts, even in addition to the one mm -hmm. if you don't bring your own mm -hmm. dessert. So, mm -hmm. anyway, that was that was fun. My, although 
there were echoes of our, our storytelling guests today, last night. I was up at Cafe Lena, where we have an open mic, and the featured teller there was Barbara McCarthy. Mm -hmm. Oh. And Barbara McCarthy is from Ireland. And I said to myself, wow, I just love to listen to someone talk with an Irish brogue. And then I thought, oh my goodness. I said, <laughs> oh joy. Because a double dose. A double dose. Uh, joining us as our, as our guest today uh, is Anne, McGree, Anne Marie McLaughlin, who I've known since very early on in my storytelling career, mm -hmm. um, who hails from Scotland, but she's really Irish. She's raised her family in Scotia, and, and she's just fun to listen to. And Anne-Marie, we're so pleased to have you with us. Uh, and as a storyteller goes, and as an Irish storyteller goes, she's been a bit reluctant. She has all these stories, but she really, sometimes you have to encourage her to tell stories. And we've encouraged her to be with us today and to hear some charming, charming stories. And fabulous that I can remember many a story circle meeting. You would you would come when we were meeting in Scotia and say, well, I really don't have a story to tell tonight. But then somebody would tell a story and you would go, oh, that reminds me of a story. And off you'd off go you'd into go. a wonderful, um, spontaneous story that was always Fabulous. Whereas I have to study and and outline and and uh, but your stories seem to just pour for me, Anne Marie. Oh, thank you, Kate. It, it's so nice to have you here. It really is. Just thank wonderful. you, Joe. And I, it's, it's, Kate was telling that I remember one of those stories because there was a story someone had told at one of our gatherings about how her grandparents met, and you didn't have a story that night. She, but you said, but I do have the story about how my grandparents met. Actually, it was my parents. Your parents met. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm, well, I screwed it up already. Uh, well, but relatively speaking, you got well, it correct. I, I got it correct. Um, and it had to do with the fact that your dad had gone to work in Scotland, and as kind of an expatriate Irish lad, they would go down to the boat when it docked from Ireland to kind of check out who was getting off. That's right. And, and he... Oh, let her tell. Well, I'll, well but you can tell that story along with us. But Anne-Marie, it's so nice to have you here. Thanks. And, and uh, you know, growing up, was story must have been part of your life. But I've also learned a lot about Irish storytelling from you. Like, I learned about what a Cayley is. Oh, a Cayley is a big part of my life. And what's a Cayley, pray tell? A Cayley is a gathering where music and song and dance takes place and storytelling also. And in Donegal, Ireland, my father's house was the Cayley House. They lived in a rural area and the... And they played music they like played this? Music. And they had music every weekend. They were all farmers and they would have the music and storytelling at night. And um, so that was a part of my culture to hear mm -hmm. the stories. and. My grandfather came to live with us, and he was a Shan Nos singer. That means an old style singing. And he used to sing those old, old ballads with about 15 or 20 verses. And my sister and I would be rolling our eyes, <laughs> <laughs> thinking, is this song never going to end? And unfortunately, after he was dead, my love for Shan Nos singing really grew. Mm -hmm. And I researched all those songs that he sang. Mm -hmm. They were like a story in themselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They would be telling the story of immigration mm -hmm. or famine. Mm -hmm. And they were wonderful, wonderful mm -hmm. stories. And I became a librarian, and I worked at Trinity College in Dublin. Mm -hmm. And I discovered one day, quite by accident, the penny broadsheets they used to sell on market day in Ireland. Mm -hmm. They would be sold for a penny. And it would contain a number of these songs. Oh. And so we weren't supposed to photocopy them because they were so precious. But uh, <laughs> I, I did indeed uh, photocopy them. And I have a huge, huge collection of those wonderful Irish ballads. Oh, wow. And my passion in life is Irish dancing. Mm -hmm. I do set dancing. It looks like American square dancing. American square dancing did evolve from Irish set dancing. Mm -hmm. And so I participate in that once a week in Albany 
and enjoy it very much. And then sometimes you go for weekends. I just did. Oh. I, I went away two weekends ago to the Cultus Culturi Erin Convention in Parsippany, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. There were thousands of musicians there at that traditional Irish Musicians Association uh, convention, and we had a wonderful weekend. And how many t-shirts did you go through? Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Anne-Marie was telling me once that the more t-shirts she goes through, when she gets, uh, let's see, women women don't, uh, women, when, when she glows so much she after dancing so much. that she might want to change into a fresher shirt. Ah. And a three shirt, what was it, a three shirt evening is spectacular, yes. something like that. Yes. So we had a lovely weekend dancing and listening to music and mm -hmm. wonderful food. It was mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. Now, Emery, can I ask you just, uh, you, you know, you're married to a fellow named John McLaughlin, who's also Irish. Yeah. Uh, but he grew up in the States. Yes, he and was born and bred in Schenectady, New York. And his father is from Donegal, from the same place as my father. So when John graduated from college, his first year he was graduated, he took a trip to Donegal and loved it. And went back the following year and met me. Ah. And so, because my granny was Anne-Marie McLaughlin, and his granny was a Miss McLaughlin who married a Mr. McLaughlin. <laughs> and they were all from the same little area in Donegal. We had to double check that we were not related to each other. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. We were not. We were yeah. not. <laughs> but three branches of the McLaughlins are in my family tree. <laughs> so you're definitely Anne Marie McLaughlin, is what you're saying. Yes, my yes. granny, who was Anne Marie McLaughlin, married a Mr. Doherty. So she became Anne-Marie Doherty. And then she died in the bad flu epidemic in Ireland in 1918. Mm -hmm. And my father never knew her because mm -hmm. she died at his birth. So he said when he got married to my mom, if we ever have a daughter, it would be nice to call her Anne-Marie. So I was born Anne-Marie Doherty, and I became Anne-Marie McLaughlin. Oh. My granny had been Anne-Marie McLaughlin, who became Anne-Marie Anne Doherty. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, just listening to the connections is a bit of a story in itself. <laughs> yes. So there you go. Um, How about a story? I think because, it's time. Because she has three for us today. Three for us, and so we, we want to hear them all. Exactly. Okay. This is a true story. When I was a wee girl, I never lacked for food. There was always plenty of food. My father was a farmer who had a great garden of vegetables. My mother was a fabulous cook. She made all her homemade brown bread every day and homemade soups. The only food item missing was fruit. We did not get much fruit. I remember every Christmas, we got an orange in our stocking, and that was delicious. We got an occasional apple, Fruit was scarce. Now we lived out in the country, and every September, Mum would hand each of us a bucket and say, go up the top of the garden up there and don't come back till you have that filled with brambles. And she would make bramble jam, which is like a blackberry. And very occasionally, when she would go downtown, she would buy bananas. Now, bananas are heavy, and she had to come home on the bus with her two big shopping bags, so she would usually only buy two or three bananas. So she would serve each of us a little piece of a banana. Now, I loved bananas. And they were so delicious. And I said one day, when I grow up, I'm going to buy me a whole bunch of bananas, and I'm going to eat them all myself. <laughs> now, it happened that my uncle Peter was in the house visiting us that day. and Peter. He's from County Down, married to Bridget, Mum's eldest sister. Now, Peter is not the full shillin', if you know what I mean. <laughs> he was the kindest, sweetest person you could meet. But he never had a real job. He always had these little jobs. He might be a flagman on the road for a construction crew some weeks, and sometimes he worked on a farm. And sometimes he was a day laborer down at the dock unloading a boat. But he was a sweet, sweet man. So he heard me say how much I loved bananas. So a week or so later, he arrived up to, out at our house with a banana tree. 
I don't know if you've ever seen a banana tree, but it's about four feet long with dozens and dozens of bananas hanging on a central stalk. And he said, this is a present for Anna Marie. Now my mother, who was devoutly Catholic, wondered if these were stolen bananas. Now if these were stolen bananas, we might be committing a sin by eating something that was stolen. On the other hand, she couldn't ask him directly where he did get the bananas because that would be an insult to his hospitality. Maybe he bought the bananas as a gift for me. But she strongly suspected they were stolen. Now, she couldn't tell anyone that we had these bananas because if she had told anyone we had the bananas, maybe he would lose his job mm -hmm. or be arrested or get in some kind of legal trouble. So we had to not tell anyone we had the bananas. So the first day the bananas arrived, I eagerly opened one, but it was brick hard, very dark green, and didn't taste nice at all. So Daddy, being the farmer, said, aren't they supposed to be yellow? I said, yes, indeed, they're supposed to be yellow. He said, well, he said, I think these are not ripe yet. So I said, how are we going to get them ripe? And he said, leave it to me. So behind the kitchen boiler, there was a big cupboard. We called it the hot press. And he took the shelves out the hot press, and he put a big hook on the ceiling, and he tied a rope around the top of the stalk of the banana tree and hoisted it up to the inside of the cupboard. Well, day by day, the sweet smell of bananas were wafting all through the house. And every morning I'd come down before I went to school, I was about eight. And I'd say, are the bananas ready? And we would open up the door and look in and, no, no, not quite ready yet. Well, unfortunately, they all became ready at the same time. So the very first day that they were ready, Mammy said, would you like a banana on your cornflakes? Oh boy, it was delicious. She said, would you like to take a banana to school for a snack? Oh yes. And when I came home from school, guess what I had? <coughs> Another banana. This was wonderful for about three days. <laughs> on the fourth day, my dad said, Ah, Mary, don't be giving me any more of them bananas. They're causing me terrible constipation. <laughs> and Mammy said, That's funny, Willie, because they're causing me the opposite effect. I can't eat any more of the bananas either. So my sister, Kathleen, and my brother, Dennis, and I had to eat all the bananas. <laughs> Now, we didn't have a freezer where we could have made banana bread and froze it, and she wasn't sharing our produce with any of the people in case it were stolen. And my brother Dennis said, why did you have to go and wish for bananas? Why couldn't you have wished for black grapes? And I remember the day that he said to Mom, Mommy, I wish I was very sick and in hospital. And my mom said, that's not a nice thing to say. Why would you wish to be sick? He said, because if I were sick and in hospital, people might come and visit me and bring me black grapes. So she went downtown and she bought him <laughs> black grapes. So my sister, after five days of eating bananas, refused to talk to me. She <laughs> fell out with me because she wasn't all that fond of bananas in the first instance. And my brother, grumbled mightily about eating the bananas. So the moral of my story is, be careful what you wish for, because you might get it. <laughs> and it might look like a banana. Right? Well, Wonderful. It might look like four dozen four bananas, dozen it bananas. sounds like. A tree of bananas. <laughs> and people ask me when I tell that story, and do you still like bananas? <laughs> and of course I still like bananas. <laughs> I can, oh. That is a wonderful story. Thank you. It is just, and you know, you can see the, the well-intentioned stevedore uncle uh, light-footing a, light a, a tree of bananas uh, when he was unloading the boat. And all of that back and forth on, the, on things makes the story. And then just the enthusiasm for you as a child 
and how the enthusiasm aged. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, yes, I, I'm like that. Leftovers, I like having leftovers, but about the third time I have the same thing in a couple of days, that's about that my interest has even Arenda Saba, well that could I, that, I could freeze that. But, uh, but yeah. wasting food was also a oh. big a big sin. Oh you, you couldn't waste any food. And where were your children starving? Did you have did you have to eat food because there were children starving? Starving in Africa? In Africa. <laughs> oh. And where were your children starving? I think it was Africa too. Your Africa <laughs> but our in my family they were starving in Armenia. Armenia. <laughs> and and I I, I I never asked why. Did you know where Armenia was? No. Oh, okay. No, but I think there were Armenian refugees in right. Bridgeport, ah. uh, where my parents grew up, and they must have heard the stories. And ours, I, I'm the only person I know that, 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 that China is a, is a, is very popular. Oh, uh, starving children, <laughs> right? In China. Now, Anne Marie, when when did you first tell that story? Do you remember? I don't remember. It is a true story, and, and I've told it often, um, but I don't remember when I first told it. Mm -hmm. Did you tell it as a little girl? Yes. Okay. <laughs> that, well, because the, 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 one of the attributes of a, of a good family story is that it kind of bubbles up very early in the relationship with the story, and it lasts. And, and that, that sounds like one of those so, kind of things. Well, it, it, it's it's a kind of story that the family will repeat. Uh, any any member of your family probably, at some point when they had a they looked at a banana, they went, "Oh, do you remember all those bananas, Uncle Peter?" Peter, yeah. yes. Bro gave Anne Marie because she opened her big mouth. My <laughs> my son Owen is a preschool teacher mm -hmm. in Vermont, in Burlington, and he also runs an after school program. And the children love him because he tells stories. Ah, mm -hmm. Owen. And he has told my banana story <laughs> to the children, and they have loved that mm -hmm. story. And uh, he phones me nearly every day to run by a story, <laughs> to get my opinion on a oh, story. Really? And he always begins by saying, Mom, do you have time to hear a story? <laughs> and of course, of course. I always have time to hear a story. From your son, so, yes. So your son grew up to be a storyteller, preschool teacher, yes. kind of like, like his, his mom. Mother. Yes. <laughs> I have the, another. The banana doesn't fall too far from the tree. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I have an. I have another story about my mother. My my mother did not tell me she was dying, and I received a phone call early early June one year, and she said, "I know you're planning on coming home in August. Do you think you could switch the ticket and come home in June?" That was an unusual request. Why would my mother be asking me to switch my ticket? So then I said, mother, are you sick? She said, oh, I am. I said, are you very sick? She said, I am. I said, do you have cancer? She said, yes. I said, when did this start? She said, New Year's Day. She said, we all went out for a meal somewhere in Northern Ireland. And she, that evening, became quite sick and vomiting and pains in her belly. And she accused the restaurant where she had eaten that they had served bad food. Well, no one else had been ill, only my mother. So this food poisoning episode lasted about a month. And my father kept saying, Mary, I don't think that's food poisoning because it would only last one or two days. And you've been vomiting and having belly ache for a month now. I think you should see your doctor. Now, my mother had never been ill. Never, never been ill, never been in hospital, never been sick. So with great reluctance, she trotted off to the doctor and he did some tests. And he told her that she had an inoperable liver cancer and she had six months approximately to live. And that was in January. And now we were at June. So she phoned and asked if I could come home. And I said I could be there in one day. So I flew home and she was very ill. And thank God we had the wonderful people at hospice who came every day to my home and they attended my mother. They were so, so fantastic. I couldn't have coped with nursing and taking care of her without the help of hospice nurses. 
so when it came very near the end of her life, she said to me, I don't want to have a wake in one of those newfangled funeral parlors. Do you think we could have a wake at home? And I said, oh, sure, mother, whatever you want. I had never been to a wake. I had no idea what a wake involved, but I was eager to please her. And I said, do you want to pick out a nice outfit that you would wear in your coffin? She goes, no, no, she said. Give all the clothes in that cupboard to Mary Bridget over in Donegal and give all the rest of those clothes to the cancer charity shop and they can raise money. And she said, you can dispense all my jewelry to wherever you want it to go and anything in the house that's mine you can have. And I said, fine. I said, but what are you going to wear in the coffin? She said, well, I would really like a Child of Mary dress. Now, at that point, I should have said, excuse me, what exactly is a Child of Mary dress? But I didn't ask that question. And so she did indeed die 20 days after I arrived. It was very horrible cancer death. And I was glad to see her out of her pain and suffering. So the funeral undertaker arrived at 3 a.m. And I said, she wants to be buried in a Child of Mary dress. Have you any idea where I would buy such a thing? He said, oh, in olden days, we called it a shroud. I said, oh, she's not going to be buried in a shroud. He goes, yes, that's her wish, to be buried in a shroud. And you have to honor her wish. And so they took her away. And they brought her back a few hours later. And Daddy and I stayed up all night. And we removed all the furniture from the back bedroom and really got the whole house all spruced up. And I did a lot of baking because I knew a lot of people would be coming. And we put her body up in the back bedroom. Now, according to Irish custom at wakes, men do nothing. They just sit around and they visit with each other and they smoke pipes and they drink beer and they talk and they tell stories. And the woman of the house do all the work. Well, guess what? There was only one woman in the house, and that was myself. So it turned out that I'd have to greet the visitors that came, and go upstairs and say the rosary, back downstairs and make the tea. Upstairs and say the rosary, downstairs and make the tea. This continued forever, I thought. Finally, her body was being removed on early on Sunday morning. And I thought, I need a private moment of my own without all the crowds bothering me to say my private goodbye to my mother. And as I entered the bedroom, one of the blessed candles that was around the coffin had melted and bent over. And as I walked in the door, it touched the wallpaper and the flame shot up the wall. The wallpaper was flocked velvet ostrich feathers <laughs> in peach and cream and the wallpaper was thick. And the minute that the flame touched, the flame just shot up the wall. I nearly had a heart attack. My heart was pounding in my breast. But I quickly ran next door to the bathroom and soaked a big bath towel with water and slapped it on the wall. And thank God the flame did not reach the ceiling. If it had, our house would have been on fire. But because the smoke and the damage only went about an inch below the ceiling. I did manage to get all of that flame out. And when I looked at the mess, it was a blackened, charred mess and smelled really bad. I thought, oh my goodness, the priest and all the people are coming this afternoon to take Mary, my mother, off to the church to be kept overnight and buried in the morning. And it happened that there was an old lady downstairs making breakfast. She was a distant cousin of my father's from Ballymena in Northern Ireland. She was in her late 70s. So I didn't want my father to see any of this. So I ran downstairs and I said, Maggie, can I speak to you privately upstairs for a minute? And she trotted upstairs and she said, oh, holy mother God, was it cremated Mary wanted? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, but Mary almost got cremated. <laughs> it's a good job I walked in at the exact second I walked in or this house would have been on fire. She said, oh, don't you worry about that mess. We'll fix it. I said, how are we going to fix it? She said, knowing your mother, 
wouldn't your mother have another roll of that wallpaper in that big hall closet upstairs? I said, I don't, I don't think so. She said, of course she would. She said, you go look for the paper and I'll go get paste. I said, we don't have any paste, wallpaper paste. She goes, oh, I can make paste. I said, how are you going to make paste? She said, out of flour and water, makes grand paste. And she said, don't tell anyone. So she went down to the kitchen and came back with a bowl of flour and water. <laughs> and she said, now your job is not to let anyone come up here. I said, how am I going to do that? She said, say the rosary. Big long prayers <laughs> to keep everybody downstairs. And I said, and what are you going to do? She said, I'm going to rip off the burnt wallpaper and put on the new wallpaper. I was tempted to say, oh, you can't do that. You're too old. <laughs> But I didn't say that. I, le I left her and I went downstairs and they were all eating breakfast. And I didn't have to say the rosary because nobody rushed upstairs. And after a while, maybe an hour, Maggie came down and she gave me the thumbs up. And I went upstairs and I looked and it was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. She had ripped off all the burnt section of wallpaper. It was just in one corner. And she put on the new wallpaper. And you couldn't tell that anything had happened. And there was an odor of burning. But the candles were burning. <laughs> so you would attribute it to the candles that were all around the room burning. And as I looked over and into my mother, I thought she was smiling. <laughs> And I thought how lucky we were that I walked in at that exact moment. Otherwise, the fire brigade would be coming and carting mom down the stairs in her coffin. And that would not be a good end to an Irish wake. <laughs> oh, oh Anne-Marie. Oh. Well, it was a good thing that Maggie was downstairs, too. Yes. That's for it sure. was wonderful. That's true. Yeah. And she was a great help to me. And we never, ever did tell. What happened? Except now on, on, on uh, public television. Public television. <laughs> well, yeah. my father died last year, so he would have been the main one I'd have been hiding that fact from. Mm -hmm. And he lived to 95 mm -hmm. years old, and he fell last Good Friday and broke his hip. Uh -huh. And then they took him in and operated on him, and he was too old at 95 to get a new hip, and he died in the recovery room. Mm -hmm. We had another wake. <laughs> but it wasn't quite as eventful as my mother's wake. <laughs> Which probably was just as well. We sang all day long at my father's wake. Is that oh. right? We, we booked a really posh hotel. And we decided no more wakes at the we house. We were going to burn down the house. And <laughs> we were years. going to have the, the luncheon and reception at the hotel. And I said to the lady in the hotel, do we have to vacate this room at any particular time? She goes, no, we have nothing booked. You can have the room all day long, as long as you like. And we had tons of people who were great singers and great storytellers. And we stayed there after the lunch all day long and sang every song that my father knew. And it was wonderful. Uh, so it, 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 was that a Kaylee or that was just a That was a, just a wake. That was just a wake. Yeah. But a, but a Similar sort of format, though, a different yes. uh, reason the music, for gathering. The music would have been the same, and the singing yeah. would have been the same. Dancing was lacking. We didn't dance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it, it was, my dad would have enjoyed it very much. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, well, we'll come back to you. We're going to do a little commercial message about what's been what's planned in storytelling. Um, in the month of June. June, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, we we tape ahead, so it's it's sometimes confusing what month we're pretending to be in. And sometimes we just get confused. <laughs> I mean, that's the other problem. Uh, what's going on? Next well, month? June third, the first Tuesday, is your new first Tuesday tales and stuff at Arthur's Market and Historic Coffee House, in the center of the stockade by the statue of Lawrence, hmm. and. You yourself will be the guest. I will be my own guest, telling <laughs> stories of uh, war paint and gunpowder. And uh, it's a series of stories that really talk about the, uh, the Revolutionary War in the Upper Hudson Valley, ending in Saratoga. And uh, I love to tell them. They're, uh, they're informative and entertaining. And there'll be uh, a couple of poets 
and uh, maybe a folk singer there too. So it'll be a nice night in the uh, old stockade. So it's open mic for storytelling, music, and spoken word. So come and join us. And the food is fabulous. Come early. Um, so they have time to make the food for everyone. That's right. That's right. Yes. And then the next thing on my list is the storytelling open mic up in Saratoga. This will be the one that closes the season. They take July and August off. So it's the uh, second Wednesday of the month, and that will be June 11th. And it will be at Woodlawn Commons in the Harkness Building, part of the Wesley community just west, southwest of the Skidmore campus. And if you know where the hospice building is, it's right behind the hospice building. It's the middle of the complex that's behind the hospice building. And this is storytelling. No reading, please. And the next story circle meeting is the third Wednesday, uh, June 18th, at the Pine Hills branch of Albany Public Library. And that's for people who want to share stories under development. And if they would like feedback from the listeners, they can get it. Or if not, not. They're in control. And they might just say, just tell me the good stuff. And because sometimes when stories are new, like when babies are new, you just want the good stuff. You don't want anyone to point out, what's that funny little rash? You don't, you don't want new, you don't want no, you don't want that. Yeah. OK, and then I will be doing something near the beginning of July. Uh, Women Artists of the 20th Century, a program that I'm putting on on Tuesday, July 8th at 4.30 at Weawaka Center for Women, um, just east of uh, Lake George Village. It's just a mile uh, out of Lake George Village. And I'll be talking about the Tiffany girls who made the Tiffany lamps. Margaret Bourke White, who was a photographer during the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and Georgia O'Keeffe, who stayed at Weawaka. Oh, really? I didn't know. Yes, and then she and her husband uh, Stieglitz, uh, his family had a place on Lake George, right. so that's why there was a, a exhibit of Georgia O'Keeffe's artwork from Lake George at the Hyde. The Hyde. Thank you. Recently. I will be uh, showing slides during this program, well, a PowerPoint, uh, but, uh, so you can see all this art. Because art, you really have to see. You, right. you, can, you can only wave your hand so much, and it doesn't work so well. But for the Georgia O'Keeffe section, she wrote a wonderful book near the end of her life, giving commentary on her, her works. And so you will be hearing her own words describe her works. For instance, do you know why she painted flowers so big? Nope. She said, I paint, I paint the flowers so big so that even busy New Yorkers will stop uh -huh. and see what I see when I look at flowers. Wow. Isn't that a great line? Yes. And so just, just yesterday, I passed a, uh, some tulips, and I went, you know, I don't think I know what the inside of tulips look like. Uh -huh. So I looked into this yellow tulip, and there were these black, six black sort of, pet, not petals, but markings um, on there. And, and then the stamens coming up. And it was, it was quite lovely. You know, it's, they're just more than just, you know, petals going up like that. So that will be followed by a Southwestern dinner because Georgia O'Keeffe spent her, um, the last four or five decades of her life in New Mexico. So you can find out more about that on the Weawaka's website, which is Weawaka, and you can see on the slide how to spell that, uh, .org. That's what I know about the coming attractions. Well, and if you want some old attractions, Right. And I'm not talking about me. I'm <laughs> talking about our uh, web page um, where uh, guest storytellers from this show um, are edited down. So you just have their stories. You don't have any of our pattern. Uh, but they're a wealth of great storytelling. So I would. And uh, it's over 100 stories now in our collection. And there'll be three more. Right. Uh, right. <laughs> once Anne Marie's stories. And that web page is. 
www.storycircleatproctors.org. Right, and you click on the YouTube button. There you go. And I've got them organized as humorous, personal, historical, traditional, uh, literary. Literary. But you can just, once you get to YouTube, you know, they come up with selections that are similar. and uh, You can browse however you like. Mm -hmm. And I guess the only other thing is that there will be another season of uh, storytelling starting in September at Proctor's and at uh, the Glen Sanders Mansion and a new venue up in the Fort Salem Cabaret Theater. So yes. that'll be something to look forward to if you're up north. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're here with Anne Marie McLaughlin, who is uh, one of the most en engaging personalities that I've been privileged to meet in my storytelling connection. Uh, Anne-Marie, um, you get back and forth to visit your mom and dad while they're alive. Uh, does your family go back and forth to Ireland regularly? Or yes, how does we have been very fortunate. We have gone back to Donegal every year for about 30 years. Wow. But last year when we were there, it was not enjoyable. My husband is not well. He's slightly handicapped and getting around was difficult and walking for him was difficult and going through airports <laughs> was difficult. So we've decided this year that we're not going. Mm -hmm. And I will miss going back. I particularly enjoy leaving hot, humid New York when it's hot and humid in the month of August and going over to Donegal where it's always about 60 degrees. So this year I will miss being there. But mm -hmm take care of my husband instead. Mm -hmm. well, well, mm -hmm. good for you, do what you can. Yeah. Do you have another story for us? I do. Uh, another true Oh, and we have plenty of time. We have 15 have, um, minutes. So. I have a, a true story to tell. When I was a young woman, I lived in Dublin, and I worked at Trinity College in the library at Trinity College. And I lived sharing a house with a lovely woman called Greta Ruddy. And Miss Greta Ruddy was a retired school ma'am, very prim and very proper. And we shared a house. I had a small living room and kitchen upstairs and a bedroom. We shared a bathroom. And she had upstairs her bedroom. And then downstairs, she had the normal house, of living room, dining room, kitchen. Now, in her living room, she had a telephone. <coughs> I did not have a telephone. Back in the 1970s, hardly anyone had a telephone. Nowadays, everyone has a telephone. But back then, if Greta was around the house, I could go into her living room and use her phone. Right outside my front gate was a big Dublin telephone kiosk. All my friends had the telephone number of that Dublin kiosk. It was quite big. It, two or three people could fit inside it. And it was painted pale green and dark green. And the word T-E-L-E-F-O-N printed in big bold letters above the door. And it was brightly lit. And you put sixpence in the coin slot and you got a local call. So if I needed to make a call when Greta wasn't around, I would slip outside to the phone kiosk. And all my friends had that number. And if I knew they were calling at a certain time, I could be upstairs with my window open, listening to hear that phone ring. And if sometimes I didn't hear the phone ring and a passerby did, they would knock on my door and say, phone call for you. <laughs> so it worked out wonderfully well. So this particular evening, I had taken a bath and got dressed for bed, put on my nightie. But I remembered I was expecting a call at 9 PM. So I thought, well, I'm not going to go upstairs and change. I won't be long outside. It's a lovely summer's evening. I'll just slip out like this in my nightie and slippers and get the call and be back in 10 minutes. So about 5 of 9, I went out and stood by the phone booth and waited. And usually, my friend is very punctual. But that particular night, he was a good 5, 10 minutes late calling me. So I stood out there. And then he did call. We concluded our conversation in about five minutes. And I went to re-enter the house. My key was going in the lock, but the door was not opening. Then I realized the deadbolt was on the front door. So I was banging on the door, ringing on the doorbell, calling Greta's name. Greta was not hearing a thing. 
She took out her hearing aids, took two sleeping pills, and was sound asleep. So I'm stranded out there with no money, no pocketbook, no coat, wondering how I'm going to get in. So I go back to the phone booth, and I phone the operator, who happened to be a young Irish lad, and I said, could you help me? I'm locked out of my house, and if you could please ring this phone number inside my house, I think Greta will hear the phone, and when you, she comes to the phone, tell her, Anne-Marie is locked outside the front door, please open the door. And he was laughing, he thought this was <laughs> hilarious. And he said, I, I will do that. He said, I will, I will call the number. And sure enough, that very kind gentleman, every couple of minutes, he was ringing that number. And I was out on the street and I could hear it loudly going, bring, bring. Why she couldn't hear it, I don't know, but I could hear it clearly outside on the road. So I was banging on the door, ringing on the bell. The phone was bring, bringing every few minutes. Greta was not stirring. After about an hour out there, I was beginning to get a little bit worried about what I was now going to do. When up the street came the local police guardie. Now, I lived on a beautiful, beautiful street. Griffith Avenue in Dublin is one of the most prestigious, beautiful streets, big, big, wide boulevard, tree-lined the whole way down, and the homes were beautiful. I was very fortunate to live on such a beautiful street. So I see the officer coming towards me, and I thought, I'd better talk to this fellow and explain my predicament. So I stopped him, and I explained, I live here. So he said, do you have any ID on you? No, I didn't have any ID on me. But when Greta would open the door, she would confirm I did indeed live there. So he immediately leapt into the rescue of the damsel in distress mode. And he told me his name was Seamus. Now Seamus had a friend who lived four or five doors up on Griffith Avenue who was a roofer. And the roofer would have a ladder. And he would go and get the ladder and bring it back and knock on Greta's upstairs front bedroom window. And I would get in. I thought, sounds like a plan. Good idea. <laughs> so he said, it's getting cold. Why don't you wait inside the telephone booth while I go get the ladder? I said, good idea. So I go back into the telephone booth and I'm standing there. And he had gone about two doors up when he turned back and looked at me. I don't know what he was thinking, but he came racing back, yanked open the door of the telephone booth and said, you don't look decent at all at all. He <laughs> says, get out of there, hide in the bushes. <laughs> and I'm thinking, hide in the bushes? Why have I got to hide in the bushes? He said, you don't look decent at all at all. Apparently the light in the telephone was shining through my nightie. <laughs> so I had to go hide in the bushes and off he went to find the roofer friend. They weren't gone very long when a few minutes later, the Seamus, the policeman, and his friend arrive with a big long ladder. And they proceed to have a big argument about which one of them is going up the ladder to <laughs> knock on the door. Seamus thought it was his duty to go up the ladder since he was the police officer in charge of this case. But the roofer said, have you ever been up a ladder, Seamus? Seamus said, never up a ladder. <laughs> the roofer said, I go up and down ladders all day long. I'm safer to go up the ladder. And you're a bit, well, overweight. Seamus was a bit insulted at that remark. But indeed, he was a little bit overweight. And the roofer kept saying, let me go up the ladder. And they kept arguing and arguing and arguing. And finally, the roofer said, OK, if she did wake up, she would recognize that you are a police officer and she won't get such a fright, whereas I would be a stranger and she might get a bad fright. So yes, you go up the ladder. And I'm still hiding in the bushes. <laughs> so Seamus goes up the ladder and with his nightstick, he's banging and banging on the window. And Greta is still not moving. And the phone is still going, bring, bring. <laughs> and I'm still ringing the doorbell and hiding in the bushes. After about 20 minutes, 
Greta finally wakes up. Now, I had been outside approximately two hours by this time. Now, it's a very lovely avenue, and the people who are out walking their dogs and walking home now are assembling <laughs> around the front door because this is some big goings on going on in Griffith Avenue this evening. So we now have quite a crowd of people <laughs> around the ladder. And Greta wakes up and looks at the window and she sees someone at the window. And poor Greta, she got the fright of her life. She almost had a heart attack. So she raced downstairs and phoned the police <laughs> that there was someone breaking into her house on a ladder at the top bedroom window. <sighs> Fortunately, there was a local Garda car. The police car was only about two blocks away. And they came zooming up to Griffith Avenue with the lights blaring, the siren going. And that attracted more people to come Ooh. out and stand outside. And they were very surprised to see their colleague, Seamus, <laughs> up the ladder, banging <laughs> on the window. So finally, Greta opened the window and peeked out and she saw this big assembly of people and me and she said is that yourself Anna Marie what are you doing out there in your nighty and I said well it's a long story Greta <laughs> could you just unbolt the door and let me in so she did <laughs> Now, did you ever see Seamus to the roofer again? <laughs> no. Oh. And this didn't make the papers? <laughs> no. Oh, well, that, I guess you could be thankful for that, that a newspaper reporter wasn't part of the... But it did make me think that in all those damsel in distress folk tales, they never had problems like you had, that they never had two heroes arguing over who should go up the ladder. Well, the damsel was never in her nighty either. I mean, th those were, this is, this is kind of a, a PG rated, you know, damsel story. <laughs> and, and I like the go hide in the bushes. Kind yes. of thing. Oh, and now this story about you and the, and the, the nighty and being locked out, um, if I were to ask any of your kids if they knew this story, they would probably say, oh, yes. They could tell you verbatim that story. <laughs> Is that right? They could tell you verbatim that story. Okay. Well, there's, so it's, been, uh, it's been become part of the tradition of the McLaughlin clan. Okay. Yes. So, you see, yeah, you know, I think of Trinity College, I think of the Book of Kells, and now I'm going to have to think of Anne Marie and her nighty right. uh, drawing a crowd. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and during the time I worked at Trinity, that was what they called the Troubles in Northern Ireland. And we would often have um, bomb scares, and we'd have to evacuate the library. And uh, we had many stories to tell about those wonderful days working in Trinity and all the things that went on during those troubling times in Dublin. Oh. So it was uh, a great experience to live there at that time. So did you work at the, the big historic library yes, there? Yes, yes. Whoa! <laughs> one, one night a week I worked in the old library, uh -huh. and the rest of the time I was on the reference desk in mm. the newer part mm -hmm. of the library. So only one night a week in the old mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's changed greatly nowadays. It's all different and mm -hmm. remodeled. Mm -hmm. But I loved working there. It was wonderful. Wow. Oh, well, I bet. historic. I bet. And yeah. Even without your tales. You <laughs> we had all one, the other stories. Are, yeah. We had one old gentleman, a Mr. Tolpegan, who was a Russian Jew. And he was writing a dictionary of Sanskrit. And he'd been there for years and years. And he barely spoke any English. And he was only at the letter M when I left, so, and he was about 90. And whenever we would have those forced evacuations of the library due to the bomb scares, when the police arrived with their dogs to do a search, mm. they would find Mr. Tulpegan still in his little cubby upstairs, not moving, not evacuating the place. So it was funny. Mm. Uh. Well, I must say this has been delightful, uh, delightful. And, and, and we have a little over four minutes left. A little over four minutes left. Well, um, Anne-Marie, um, we've talked a little bit about uh, 
your mom and dad meeting at the the boat dock, and you and John meeting back in in, in Donegal. Um, are there other kind of across the the pond relationships in the in the greater family? I mean, do you have a family that that is kind of found a uh, uh, a soulmate from the old Ireland country here in the States, back and forth? Yes. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. I'm not surprised. Yeah, we have lots of cousins still over there, and we visit them every year. Uh -huh. And my mother had an older brother. He had emigrated to New Jersey, and he promised that when he got settled in New Jersey, that he would bring my grandmother, my mother's mother, and all the brothers and sisters, so there was 10 in that family, to come to live in New Jersey. And unfortunately, a short time after he came to New Jersey, he died. He was in a motorcycle accident, and he got gangrene poisoning in his leg from the petrol that went in the wound, and he did die. And the young widow then gave birth to twin sons after he was dead. And we lost touch with that young woman and her twin sons because the war had come, and uh, the, the family lost touch. So when I got engaged to be married to an American, my mother said, you know, you have a cousin, twin cousins in New Jersey and an Aunt Mary. You should go look them up. My mother has no idea the size of New Jersey. <laughs> I said, well, what town did they live in? She said, I think it was Elizabeth. I said, well, Mom, I, I, I might find them one day, but I had no intention of looking for them. Years later, I was at church, and a couple in church said to me, we're going for ice cream. And we have a couple from Ireland, from Donegal, and they're visiting us. But they live in New Jersey. Would you like to join us for ice cream? I said, I'd love to. I love ice cream. So I was seated next to the elderly gentleman. And I said, what town in New Jersey do you live in? He said, Elizabeth. I said, I'm going to ask you a dumb question. Have you heard of a woman in New Jersey called Mary Dillon? He said, yes, and her twin sons, Dennis and John. I said, yes. <laughs> I said, do you know her? He said, of course I know her. She's one of my best friends. Her family are from Donegal. I said, that's right. I said, how do you know her? He said, she, she's uh, my attorney and a best friend. I said, no, it couldn't be the same woman. This woman was an uneducated woman. Well, to find out, Mary Gillen phoned me up. And she told me that she had indeed been uneducated at the time her husband died. And she had a sister who was a nun who babysat her boys to allow her to go to night school. She went, got her GED, she went to night school, then she went to law school, she became a lawyer, then she became the first woman judge in New Jersey. So she said, when are you going home? And I told her the date. And when I arrived at JFK, this gorgeous looking blonde lady approached me and she said, are you Anne Marie McLaughlin? I said, indeed. She said, I'm Mary Gillen. Well, I was crying with happiness to meet her and hear her life story. And when I got off that plane, I said to my mother, you will never guess who I met in New Jersey. Mary Gillen. Do you know she wasn't at all surprised? <laughs> she wasn't at, at all, all surprised. surprised. You well, have an interesting family, Anne-Marie. Uh, I mean, that, that you know, the, the first story you told was priceless, and the last story you told was priceless. And everyone in between. And everyone in between. And it's just been a delightful. So if you, if you think about your own families, if you think about your own stories, uh, be encouraged by Anne-Marie McLaughlin and her ability to uh, weave the love of family and country into memorable times. And thank you for joining us today, story by story. We hope you join us again. Goes all my life's a circle, sunrise and sundown. The moon rolls through the nighttime till the daybreak comes around. And all my life's a circle, but I can't tell you why. Seasons spinning round. 